It may look like another slice of English countryside, but hidden from view, as it was originally intended, is Crown Hill Fort. Built in the 1860s to fend off a continental attack from invading armies. By 1850, France, the old enemy of Britain, had recovered after the defeat at Waterloo and set about building a new naval fleet to re-establish its strength. With the launch of the first fully ironclad warship called La Gloire, the British Parliament sat up and took note, and led by Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister of the day, Britain began to construct and modernise over 70 forts to defend its harbours against the possible threat. Known as the Palmerston Follies, they stretched around the south coast, with Crown Hill Fort being the largest in the Plymouth area. As the flagship defence post, it was at the cutting edge of Victorian fort design. After nine years and a couple of worker strikes along the way, it was finally opened in 1872 at a total cost of £76,400. Now, if you put that in today's money, that's just over £4 million. Built on an exposed hill 400 metres in front of the defensive line, the seven-sided fort had a 360-degree lookout. An advancing enemy could be spotted at distance from the huge ramparts as they approached Crown Hill and would meet the first line of defence, a 30-foot deep dry ditch. The soldiers would have been housed inside, armed with rifles and artillery, able to fire on the enemy that had reached the ditch. And the idea here was to get a clean line of fire in each direction on this level. And if that wasn't enough, each Caponia was housed with 21 rifles and two cannons which fired case shot. You can just imagine the noise, can't you? Absolutely deafening. You can hear the acoustics in here with my voice and my footsteps, let alone one of these things going off. And after several rounds, the place would have been filled with smoke. There would have been no visibility and the armourers were loading by touch alone. Underground tunnels zigzagged around the fort, allowing soldiers to be deployed quickly and safely into position, but also enabling them to listen in to intruders on the outside. Up to 20 soldiers at any one time would live, sleep and eat in the barracks when they weren't on duty, receiving the most basic of provisions and kit. Today, it's reenactors that take their place, bringing to life the experience of a serving soldier. So what was life like in the barracks here in the Times? Far better than it would have been from Surrey Street outside. Yeah. At least you're in the warm, it's dry, you're given your kit, your clothes, two good meals a day. And I take it you saw no action here in the Times? No, nope, not one. We didn't actually fight the enemy at all. Yeah. So what was the daily routine like? Right, um, early in the morning, six o'clock, up, try and wake, send some men detailed then to the cookhouse. Right. Take the tea dixie down and use your tea bowl. <laughs> it's not only a tea bowl, it's a shaving bowl, or it could at night be a night bowl. Oh, well, we'll move on from that rather swiftly. <laughs> I wonder why it was so big. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess... Once you've done your drill, there wouldn't be a lot to do unless you're on duty. I guess you do maintenance as well, do you? You'd have to do maintenance on the gun, you'd have to practice. Yeah. You'd pull some guard, but then every so often a general would come along and say, right, we want you up in the moors for a couple of days, do some sham fights. Yeah. We'll put a, a dummy enemy out. We want you to fire around at you know, the targets. So what would a soldier earn? About one in tuppence a week before stoppages. That's all very well saying one in top, a lot of money. Yeah. But no, deductions for the wife or uh, money sent back to mother, stoppages for fines, stoppages for loss of kit. Yeah. You went drinking the other night, you've lost your belt. <laughs> Buy a new belt. All comes out. Sunday pay parade. Start off with one in two. Sorry, there's your total. Three and threatens three farthings. Yeah, I bet it's all the gambling that went on in here as well, well though. No doubt all some went on. <laughs> <laughs> in its heyday and fully armed, Crown Hill was garrisoned by 300 Royal Artillery soldiers. Yet despite all the practice runs, the French threat amounted to nothing and as technology moved on, the fort became obsolete. 
Today the fort is open to the public and 130 years on, it's only one of two forts of its kind that's been fully preserved in original condition. And it may be a legacy to Palmerston's imaginary foreign invasion, but the guns are far from silent. Well, the valuation day is in full swing next door and the experts are working flat out. And it is thirsty work and I've got just the tonic. Well, there is something missing from this, and it is a good job. We're just a stone's throw away from Plymouth, where they've been putting the G into G&T since 1793, at England's oldest distillery. Plymouth Gin has its roots here, at the Barbican, in the historic heart of the city centre. And of course, this place is home to the Royal Navy, and there's always been a connection between gin and the Navy, and the drink, known as Dutch Courage, was given to the sailors before they set sail. But ordinary Britons got their first taste of the spirit at the beginning of the 17th century, when William of Orange, a keen Geneva, or gin tippler, came over from Holland to seize the English throne. With royal endorsement, it quickly became a fashionable drink amongst his courtiers. William furthered the gin cause by encouraging the country to shun French imports on wine and brandy in favour of domestic distilling. The result was a gin free for all, with legal and illegal production rocketing. Home production meant that the streets were literally awash with gin, and the quality varied so much that it was frequently bottled in coloured glass and stone jars just to disguise the impurities. Gin took a grip on the country and scenes like Hogarth's painting of Gin Lane were commonplace. In London, one in three houses were selling gin, many people were paid in gin and tales were told of wives and daughters being sold into prostitution just to pay for the spirit. Mother's ruin was threatening to destroy society. By 1730, production was up to 11 million gallons. So the government decided to call a halt on this excessive consumption. What a mean lot. The Gin Act put a cap on things. By introducing duty and forcing producers to have a license, they soon got the situation under control. But as you can imagine, not without a lot of public outcry. There were still several gin distillers based in Plymouth when Mr Coates bought the Blackfriars building in 1793 and ousted his rivals by winning a court battle to be the only distiller of Plymouth gin within the city walls. His unique recipe remains the same to this day. Richard, what are the ingredients? What's so special about it? The most important thing is the water. Yeah. Soft Dartmoor water. That mm -hmm. makes it unique. Mm -hmm. But also the seven botanicals. What does that mean? Is that sort of its recipe? Yes, it is. And I've got some of them here if you want to have a look. So this is a secret recipe, but obviously not so secret right now. Uh, what goes into it is not secret, but yeah. the actual the proportions mixes and are. the proportions, absolutely. Yeah. We have juniper berries. Right. Now, essentially, every gin has juniper in it. Then we've got coriander, lemon, orange, because Plymouth gin is a very citrusy gin. Yeah. Cardamom pods from Sri Lanka, angelica root from Germany, and then uh, oris root from Italy. So talk me through the distilling process, what happens? Well essentially what happens is we put 5,000 litres of neutral grain spirit, which is basically from English wheat, yeah. 2,000 litres of Dartmoor water and the botanicals into the still. Right. They're brought to the boil slowly and carefully and then the spirit in the form of vapour goes through the swan neck of the still. And that's what's collected then? Absolutely. Yeah. Into a condenser. And then from the condenser, the spirit comes through to these spirit safes. Right. Now, they're called that because they used to be locked, and the excise man had the key. Uh -huh. In fact, he was here the whole time that the distillation was taking place. So this is still the place where the distiller can check the product. And essentially, the first part is thrown away yeah. or discarded. The middle part, when it becomes consistent and the quality is right, that's what's kept, and it's called the middle cut. Wow, how fascinating is that? So how long does the whole process take? It's only a day. Is and of course all? you don't have to keep gin. It's ready to drink almost straight away. <laughs> He's with a big smile on his face. <laughs> well, I know this might be a daft question, but how can you tell the consistency? Is it with a bit of the old... No, I wish it was. That's the expertise of the distiller. It's all nosing. It's done with the nose. Oh, they all say it's with the nose, isn't it? I see lots of glasses dotted around, so maybe we should have a test, but not with the nose. Absolutely. There's some here for you. <laughs> 
For centuries, the Navy took Plymouth gin around the world, spreading the word on this fashionable drink. They even had their own gin pennant, a green and white flag, which was hoisted while in port as an open invite to come aboard and have a drink. And it's still part of the tradition today, and each newly commissioned vessel is given a pennant and a case of Navy strength gin. Traditionally, the gin was stored near the gunpowder store. Now this gave rise to a slight problem, because if the gin spilt, the gunpowder wouldn't ignite. So a special Navy strength gin was developed. And at 57% proof, it would combust every time. The gunpowder gin mix was tested on deck to see if any dilution occurred on the way. This proof test gave rise to the alcohol measuring system, and it's a term we still use today. Well, while I'm getting used to the suck.